The Brutally Speaking podcast is proudly sponsored by Starving Artist Brewing. Starving Artist Brewing may be a small speck on Michigan's beer map, but they say big things come in small packages. A brewery who really puts their money where their mouth is, supporting underground artists far and wide. Making delicious beers with the simple belief that you should judge beer, not people. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. For over 30 years, Rockabilia has been the go-to destination for all things band merch. With over 500,000 items in their online store and collaborations with today's hottest bands, you're sure to find something you love. Use our code BREW10 at checkout and take 10% off your total order. So go pick up your favorite new piece of merch now over at rockabilia.com. Now, on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is Jacob from Chamber. This was a really good chat. Uh, The band's latest record, I Love to Kill For, is out now. It actually came out this past Friday. I was going to try to get this uh, out in time for the release, but... uh, I just basically got done with two days of Up Evil Fest here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, it was quite the <laughs> quite the fun and exhausting two days. Uh, I think anyone who has gone to a festival, uh, a multi-day festival, I should say, should attest that uh, obviously it's a very uh, exciting thing. You get to see so many bands, uh, get to see so many friends, uh, presumably, uh, or you're probably going with friends. Uh, and I'll say at least for our festival, it just... <laughs> It's exhausting kind of when you are trying to be everywhere for everyone, doing everything. So uh, friends that were here uh, playing the festival over the two days, you know, you're going back and forth trying to line up schedules, uh, you know, just essentially doing press uh, in some capacity. Uh, Also trying to spend time with my wife, uh, friends, and it just was a a really, really exhausting day. Uh, got to see a lot of great bands though. Uh, Friday basically got to see, uh, bring me to the horizon, uh, ghost inside dudes. That was great to see them crush on a smaller stage, getting to hang with, uh, Maddie and the Memphis Mayfire dudes. Um, getting, I miss day seeker. Um, but heard that they put on a pretty good sets, uh, have had Rory on. So it would have been cool to see them. Uh, also ended up finding out that Garrett from silent planet is their tour manager, which I didn't know. So imagine my surprise when I kept seeing people with photos, uh, with Garrett. Um, in this moment, it was supposed to play. There was a little bit of controversy around that uh, and whether or not uh, the festival fucked them over as far as, you know, the sets, uh, not the set time, but the stage size, uh, if it actually was supposed to be bigger or something. Uh, essentially, uh, in this moment, didn't play, went on Instagram and basically shit on the festival. So that was interesting. Uh, followed by Saturday. Uh, following in reverse, uh, Hailstorm, We Came as Romans, uh, Suicide Silence, The Guys in Crowbots, uh, The Homies in a Virtue. I did a chat with uh, Eva Under Fire, uh, vocalist Eva, and I'll get that out and put it on podcast socials here shortly. Um, also, the Ice Nine dudes uh, were playing uh, Flyleaf with Lacey. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, they basically closed the uh, ups, the lookout stage on top of the hill. Which, if you go to that festival, uh, you're probably, I don't necessarily want to say you're out of shape, but you understand, like, just the shittiness of having to go up and down that hill multiple times to go see different bands and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it was, you know, hot heat, very little shade, long lines for almost everything. Um, But, I mean, it is truly the festival experience, and I really want to thank uh, so many people, actually. Um, You know, Patrick uh, from Ice Nine for... uh, getting my wife in, uh, due to some issues, uh, with, with media passes for, for both of us. Um, great hangs with Chris and the Crowbot guys, uh, as always love seeing them. I want to thank my wife and I also want to thank my friend Sarah, who's in town. 
and uh, Dale works security at the intersection. Uh, you will inevitably have heard me talk about him a couple of times on this show. Uh, coming up, I think, actually next week, uh, talking with Tuck from Fit for a King. Uh, he and I talk about Dale for a little bit in that. Um, but Dale was super, super gracious and hospitable uh, with the fairgrounds and uh, hanging out with myself and, and my wife and, you know, just getting to see everybody. But more to the point, uh, the three of them, the reason I'm shouting them out, uh, were kind of helping me get footage all weekend so I could kind of be in, a, quote unquote, a lot of places at once. Uh, taking lots of different vantage points, pictures, media, everything you saw this last couple of days, if uh, as of when I'm going to put this out, um, was a, a big byproduct of you know friends uh, and my wife and myself kind of working together to to kind of really showcase the festival from the perspective of a goer. Um, granted, not everyone's going to have the same access or the vantage points uh, that the media passes and so forth allowed at us, but uh, it is one of those things where I really wanted to kind of make you feel like you were there. Um, so if you have been following along and looking at Instagram stories, which it seems like a lot of people have been checking them out, uh, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to maybe going next year uh, again and keep the local festival thing. I mean, this is literally in my backyard. It's like a 10-minute walk from my house. Um, so it's really great to to be a part of this uh, continuing legacy of uh, a people festival. But I think potentially I might try to go to Incarceration Fest or maybe even uh, Rock Fest over in Kadat. Um you know, just to kind of get something a little bit different, see see some of these other festivals that have been popping up over here in the Midwest uh, right around now. Um, great hangs with so many people. Uh, shout out again, Doc Coyle. Um, got to see him. He was out with the uh, Ice Nine guys. Uh, really great getting to hang with him, uh, getting to spend some one-on-one time. Obviously, if you saw the post, uh, Chris Garza from Suicide Silence. Doc and I all kind of were chatting for a hot minute. Um, you know, it's great to kind of see some of these people who I hold in high regard uh, in the podcast realm. Um, that just kind of are genuine and honest about things. And to me, I think that's a uh, huge extension of what uh, uh, makes the platform so awesome uh, is when people are willing to put themselves out there, warts and all, and just have genuine, real conversations with people. And you know how that kind of even correlates as I've been talking for almost six minutes about not the guest that's on. Uh, I think, honestly, this chat with Jacob and talking about some of the lyrics uh, for this record, this was something that... You know, it really struck me, uh, some of the things that they, the band uh, wanted to address, you know, from a social uh, standpoint and was the thing that it really kind of made me intrigued. Uh, A lot of times I think music, I hate to say it like this because it just sounds so shitty, but it's like sometimes I think music is a little bit void of substance, uh, things that make me think uh, a little bit more. And the thing that I loved about it and the thing that really intrigued me was like, you know, there was a lot of buzz from the first couple of singles uh, that the band had put out and obviously uh, them touring and so forth. Like it just, you know, they are one of those bands that everyone's on basically everyone's lips right now uh, coming up. And it was the thing where, like I said, the presser, there's a, a moment in it uh, when I was reading just the... Uh, about like what inspired the record, what inspired the first single. And I was like, fuck, I I need to hear the rest of this record. I need to talk to these guys because it seems like they are doing big things and they're kind of taking the genre and taking uh, big leaps uh, from a a lyrical and thematic perspective. So uh, without further ado, I've been blabbing long enough. Let's get into my conversation with Jacob and I'll talk to you all on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of funny. I always sometimes will get really wrapped up in my own brain thinking about where did, you know, words uh, and saying them over and over to the point of them, like mentally, to where they like lose all comprehension of like where they like what they mean. But then I start thinking about it from like, who was the first person to use like a word, and especially swear words, because like I swear, I feel like when you curse, like, like who is the first person that said shit? And like was shit in regards to like, ah, shit. And then someone's like, what? And they're like, ah, just, you know, something didn't go my way, you know, shit. And then someone steps in shit and they're like, ah, shit. And they're like, what happened now? And it's like, no, 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 I stepped in shit. This is shit too. Like just the way that like words 
take on so many different meanings and like how they uh, like changed over time to to mean so many different things and then wondering since i don't really speak any other languages like how often like is that a, a thing in other languages where like we use the exact same word for like five or six different things yeah i mean it, it is kind of crazy because they're the cuss words can mean so many different things and then like uh, sometimes you even like can take them and make them into something me meaning something totally different than what they actually mean it's it's weird especially like touring other countries they like it's they when you say like fuck here it means like something totally different over there you know it's it's crazy the first person who ever said fuck was awesome probably hopefully <laughs> well i mean it's like even thinking about like how i mean you could take it a step further and, and obviously i think you could speak to this more than i can since really only my traveling has been in the u.s uh in canada which doesn't count when you live in michigan um but is a thing where thinking about how like you know cunt is probably like one of the worst fucking things you can say here like people are like <gasps> and it's like you go over to like europe and all that kind of stuff and it's it's almost just such a a like word that just everyone uses that it's like it's not offensive it doesn't kind of mean what it means out here and it's i don't know language is language is one of those things that I, I find so fascinating and just um even like from a perspective of a vocalist like something i always find interesting is how you will turn a word that has a normal enunciation and then like make it like if it's a one syllable word now all of a sudden some people will like make a like that word like a three syllable word and just put oh, yeah. different accents on it and stuff like that and so it, it just gets it gets interesting to uh to kind of break things down like that and just kind of see um how where people take it and different connotations of of the vernacular of english language or speaking and communicating as a whole for sure man it's it's language is crazy for sure <laughs> i'm not very good at it but i try <laughs> is it something because, you know, something I've never really asked, you know, having so many vocalists on, on the podcast, but it is something that I have spoken about, you know, the fact that being in metal and metal bands and stuff like that and, and you know, the other subgenres where, you know, some people would say it's, it's quote unquote noise and maybe they're not listening to what the vocalist is saying. Is it ever kind of discouraging at times to know that you are the vocalist in a genre that sometimes people don't necessarily care about that? Um, I never thought of it that way just because it's, it's something I've, I guess I've always done, you know, I've been doing vocals for some time now. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I've never thought of that way. And, and especially it's like something when you're on stage, it's like, I mean, the people that come to shows like are singing along sometimes or just like moshing or doing whatever. So it's like, obviously they care about what we're doing, whether they care about, me or the guitar player or the drummer you know so it's like they care because they're here you know it's like not because like uh they don't know maybe i guess like the people from the outside of the metal world doesn't understand like i guess for say like my parents or you know <laughs> uh like my co-workers they're like w what are you doing like why are you like what are you even saying why are you screaming it's just like i don't know i just do it <laughs> <laughs> can't you sing it and i'm like uh it doesn't match you know? Right. I just think, always think it's kind of interesting because like when I go through and like I'll read like I used to do another show uh, with a friend of mine who was used to be a co-host on here and the show was called discography discussion and very much like the name sounds you we would listen to a band's discography and talk about it and it almost felt like a, a challenge at times because he was throwing me like just stuff I really wasn't into like from a production standpoint and all that like listening to bands like death and you oh, know. Yeah not necessarily self carnage, but like cattle decapitation and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And it's tough at times where, you know, I went into it knowing that it's like, it's not my cup of tea, like genre wise. Cause to me, it just sat like something that aggressive just sounds like, like rhythmic noise to me, like where it's like, I could listen to it and it's hard to discern like different tones or shifts in like keys or things like that. Cause it just, when you have blast beats going throughout the whole fucking thing, it's just tough. And I remember finally, like it was cattle decap where I started listening or reading the lyrics. You know, I, I wasn't necessarily able to make out the words that, you know, yeah. dude was saying, but it was a thing where I'm like reading it and I'm like, man, like these, I'll call them passages for lack of a better term. Like there's so much poignant stuff being said in this. And like, it's really interesting 
conceptually to see what he's, you know, talking about in this music. And it almost feels like a disservice because I, I don't feel like you can understand him. And I feel like it's, it's such, and I feel like that's such a disservice to like the band and what he's taking the time to clearly write and cares about. But maybe there are people eventually like me who will take the time to read what is being said and kind of maybe not be able to understand it in the context of when I listen to the music, Oh, I'm picking out this, this phrase or this, these words or whatever. But I understand like, that he is so passionate about it. And this is the vehicle and the avenue he chooses to express these words yeah. and these thoughts and emotions. And so therefore it's, I do enjoy it, but I, I just feel like largely a lot of people probably wouldn't do that. And I, I often wonder, you know, in the, in the genre where it's like so many people are quick to be like sick riffs. I can't wait for the fucking breakdown. Da, da, da. It's yeah, like yeah. short of having a mosh call or whatever. It's like, there's not really an emphasis to me. It seems on people getting hooked on the lyrics at first. It, it seems like it's a, a scene where it takes sometimes a while for people to really get the message of what a band is saying and what the vocalist is saying. And I, I just, you know, sometimes wonder if it's a little disheartening when you're like spilling your guts out on something and really putting forth the emotion into the recorded product to be like, people are just going to come up to me and be like, man, these riffs are sick. And you're like, yeah, but what about the lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think it's like at the end of the day, it's like, I chose to be a vocalist in a metal band where I could have done other things, you know? So I'm not like too like discouraged about it or, you know, cause like, I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, people do come up and be like, Hey, your vocals are cool, which is all that matters to me really. It's like, cause like lyrically, like there are going to be some people out there that are like, I don't care about lyrics. I just want riffs, breakdowns. I want the snare drum to sound crazy. I want the production to sound crazy. As long as the vocals are there, it sounds cool. You know? Um, but I think, um, there are going to be people out there that like read the lyrics and connect, you know, and, um, that's what the, like, you know, one out of 10 people at the show that come up that like that, that matters, you know, it doesn't really discourage me in any way, shape or form, especially like I write a bunch or, or write quite a bit or like come up with topics, but me and our guitar player, Gabe come up with a lot together. So it's like, he spills out his guts and they don't even sometimes know, you know, and mm -hmm. then. They're like, oh, you wrote all the lyrics. I'm just like, ah, oh, like me, Gabe, and like even our new guitar player Henry, like pitched in some stuff, you know. So it's like it's all like a, it's like a team team effort when it comes to the whole thing, pretty much. Like as far as riffs go, you know, I try to help out a little bit. I can play it a little bit, so it's like team effort all across the board. So it's not that discouraging, I think. I, I find it kind of interesting in, that we live in a day and age now where I think the, the dynamic of what a band is and, and assumed roles and so forth are kind of being flipped on their head. I, I It's so funny to be like, to think about bands and, and hear people like, oh, well, you're the vocalist, so you, you must write all your lyrics. And, you know, looking at a band like Seven Dust where it's like, Lejean doesn't really write much of the band's material. It's Clinton, you know, Morgan that do a lot of it. Right. And, you know, finding how bands work, you know, when the band DVDs were kind of starting to become a lot more popular in the late nineties, early two thousands and getting a glimpse into the studio and finding out like, Oh shit, the drummer like writes most of this stuff and then yeah. showcase it, shows it to the rest of the band and really understanding that more oftentimes than not a band is, is led kind of by an individual or, Sometimes it's more of a creative process between everyone in the band, but I, I think it's been kind of really cool to see the inner workings of bands and how everything works. And, you know, even oh, yeah. like you saying, like, I'm not necessarily the greatest guitar player, but like I might bring a riff in or something like that. And it spurns an idea collectively between, you know, Gabe and yourself and somebody, you know, the rest of the band right. that I find that to be a really interesting dynamic in music. Yeah. And I think that's like quite it happens a lot nowadays and even like back in the day like i i feel like it's been a thing it just hasn't been like at the forefront of everyone's mind just because it's like oh that's the vocalist he does the lyrics uh that's the guitar player he writes the riffs the bass player <laughs> most of the time just learns the riffs you know it's like uh I, I i don't know it's like weird because like even like to a point it's like sometimes a vocalist won't even ever write a lyric at all, you know, or the guitar player is a hired guitar player and the drummer writes all the guitar riffs, you know, it's like, but I think it's always better when the whole band can like pitch an idea, come, come together as a team and just like tackle almost everything. 
And then like even like when it comes to like touring, it's like oh like this guy does this, like the mer- like all the merch designs come from one guy or all the like stage production comes from like the idea of one guy, you know, it's like it it all happens in every part of a band, like someone picks up some role that they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something I, I've uh, to some people because it's funny. Like I know people listen to to the show, but I always assume that it's the people who are interested only in the guest. And like so, in my head, I'm like, oh, people probably don't listen to all the other episodes. So when I say like something I've been talking about, I've kind of become aware recently of like, shit, am I over explaining something that I've already explained on another episode? But it's the first time you're hearing, it, and potentially everybody else, but. I've been really interested in the idea of roles and the roles that we play uh, in different interpersonal relationships and thinking about how, you know, there's always like kind of, and this kind of will lead into a question or some topics I was thinking about, about helpless portrait that I think are interesting, but thinking about how, you know, we have like alphas uh, and you know, how like they are kind of more natural leaders and people look up to them and follow them and so forth. But at times, like, you can't always have a bunch of alphas together. Like, at some point, someone needs to understand that, like, my role is to kind of be more subservient and to Mm -hmm. kind of help uh, and be more of a role player. And I always think that it's interesting that when people get into bands, you know, your role kind of is that, like, well, these are my friends and I enjoy making music with these people. But then eventually, if you become good at it enough to where, like, there's label interest, you want to tour and stuff like that, it becomes a business. Mm -hmm. And then yep. someone has to assume the role of financier or someone has to assume the role of graphic designer. And you have to learn all these things that you probably don't give a shit about, but someone has to start taking that responsibility. And then what does it end up doing to the dynamic of the relationships in the band moving forward uh, for the rest of that band's career? And I always think it's it, it's an interesting talking point because I feel like where is the the cross section of we're doing this for fun versus this is something serious now. And we, we kind of have to, I have to take a leadership role or someone has to take a leadership role. And what does it look like when it starts happening? Yeah. I mean, I think personally it's like, I've kind of took in the role of like doing pretty much a lot of things on the business side of the band, but it's, uh, it's just cause like, that's who I've always been. Like even in past bands, like we weren't like big or nothing, but like when it came to like, merch orders or like figuring out like or like tming a a tour or whatever it's just like all right well i got an email and i got to figure out how much merch we need and this and that's fine just because like i know that the other guys in the band are also like figuring out writing and like figuring out other stuff like that so it's like i don't know and it's not that hard because it's just like i want to do it you know so i I think if, if you have someone that wants to just be that person and 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 like me and gabe kind of like tackle like merch ideas together so it kind of makes it easy but like when it comes down to the end of it i always like put the orders in or you know like for this tour like oh like who's renting for this tour coming up it's like who's who's gonna what what trailer are we gonna rent like what's going on it's like i will figure it out you know it's like i I got it like you halls there like (laughs) you know um and it and it like sometimes it does kind of like get like you know a lot of weight to carry but it's like i want to do it you know or like someone's gonna have to do it no matter what so it's like me or someone else or try to like like as as of now like we have a manager and he helps a lot too so it's like as long as you have like a decent team and they understand that you're the guy doing most of the business side of things and then on tour it's like all right like we understand that you know it's like we get it. You're doing it, and we appreciate it. As long as they're like uh, appreciation, I think you should never like take take that doing that job because like you can always be like, "Hey guys, help!" You know. And if they don't want to help, right. it, then it's a problem. So it's like for Chamber, it's never been like a problem just because like I want to do it, and I've never been like, "Oh, this is too stressful." Because it's like at the end of the day, it's like easy. You know, it is running a business, but it's like. Oh, it's like five dudes. We need to figure out merch. We need to figure out vehicle. And then that's it. You know, it's like not too crazy. 
but when it comes to like i guess bigger things it might be crazy because <laughs> like i i mean i've i've done tours like merch tours this year with like bigger bands and it's like there's a lot of stuff going on and it's just like yeah there you you need like you need like a outside team helping you like as far as like manager or like day-to-day manager and stuff like that you know you know, it's interesting having a lot of people in more in the behind scenes of touring uh, that I'm friends with at, at different various levels. And it's so crazy to to see because just when you like for me, when I think I've got a good handle on like, OK, this is like what touring at this level would be at and kind of equating it into a sports kind of analogy of like, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's, you know, high school and then you get into college and then maybe like if there's a minor league system. So for like baseball, like minor league system, and then you work your way up to you know the big leagues and all that kind of stuff it's kind of like that at times with different touring where it's like you you kind of have to understand what it takes to get to that next level and and all the things to make it sustainable it makes me wonder when you got on some of these first tours maybe doing even just from a merch perspective um how eye-opening was it to you to kind of see what it takes to kind of be at that next level um for touring um, I, I don't know, man. It's like weird because I feel like every time you get to the next level of touring, you kind of restart, you know? Right. Uh, and so therefore you're always like grinding and working your way up because you can't just go from 150 cap rooms to stadiums headlining, you know, it's like, you're going to open a stadium tour or like, it's always, it's, it's weird because like you never, I personally can't ever like guesstimate or estimate how big a band is until you actually like see them play a whole u.s tour and you're like holy crap like everyone loves them you know so Mm -hmm. it's like it is like a weird thing because it is definitely like high school then college then minor leagues and then when you go to the minor leagues you might be the hot shot but then you go into you know nba or uh (laughs) major league baseball it's like all right you're on the bench for like half of the time, you know, it's like, but you're opening the show to say like 1000 people. And it's like, that's crazy, you know, because like we've chamber as a band have done like small DIY stuff to, you know, we've done a tour with wage war last year. And it's like, we're opening up a show to like 1000 people. And it's like, this is crazy. But like half the time, it's like the, the people don't even like care. (laughs) you know but it's like sick that you're playing to that amount of people because it's like no matter what i think is good it's like if there's one person that night that's gonna come to another show that's what makes it worth it you know it's like there was like a kid recently i was on a tour doing merch and he came up to me he's like i saw chamber last year y'all opened up for wage war and i can't stop listening to you guys and i was like that's that's all that's all that tour took for me to like be like it was worth it you know it's like that one person was just like all right this is enough like that's good and like we could have came back flat broke and i'm like this sucks but that one (laughs) that one kid can't stop listening to us so i guess we're doing something right you know i feel like in those moments and i know like you know, it's something I've kind of watched at times, you know, watching, I think like one of the times I was really, really aware of it was going to see motionless and ice nine kills. And I've seen ice nine almost from kind of the, the beginning of the ascent, the ascent of where they're at now. Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, the second record that they just put out, like not the newest one, but the one before that, the mm-hmm. horror would. And I remember seeing them open. They were second to four on the Atreyu tour at the time, and then Memphis Mayfire and then Atreyu. And I remember like hearing the name. They've toured around for a decade plus. So I've seen the name on local flyers and always like the first to four on on package tours and so forth. And there was just this feeling like I remember sitting there. The crowd knew all the lyrics to this song, like to the songs. There was merch line was at least twenty people deep the whole night, and I was just was like something's happening. And to see, like, from that moment forward, what the band has done, you know, seeing them play uh, here in Grand Rapids, like our, I think it's like a 18 to 2200 cap room, and selling it out with Motionless. And I remember sitting there thinking, watching both those bands going like, what is it that separates these bands from, let's say, like yourself, or even like a, a like, more of a regional touring, quote unquote, local band. Yeah. 
And I kept thinking about it and I'm watching the show going like, there's nothing really that I feel like separates anyone. Like the music's good, but I feel like the thing I kept coming back to was it was branding. Like they kept putting stuff where you kept seeing the band name pop up. They would utilize like, and again, this is reinvesting back into your show, but like they also took stuff that you were already used to seeing from music videos or lyric videos and bringing them in and making it to where like, if you just kept seeing it, you're being hammered. Like here's our fucking band name and like 17 different fonts and different colorways and all this kind of stuff. And by the time you hear this song, the lyrics are going to be behind you flashing the chorus. So like we can help you learn the song so you can be an active participant in it. But the other thing I realized was, and this is the first time I think I've noticed it from a show going perspective that it's not just us playing a collection of songs. It's a show from the moment that the the mm-hmm. intro music comes on, stuff we're doing in between songs to maybe jam them out, you know, keep it going. And it was the first time I realized that it's like, I think that is the, those are the things that start separating bands from maybe a club level to whatever is it's kind of that branding. It's the, the familiarity. It's making it from songs to a show. And it did make me wonder if if bands have that same kind of aha epiphany moment at, at different points in their career. Like when you see these or have the tour, like is the Wage War tour, maybe there's a song that you have where you're like, shit, this hits a little bit differently in a room like this. Maybe we need more songs that ha- feature something like this in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, It's kind of hard because like, especially just because like we never get like i guess like the fans are an outside opinion on like what we do but like on stage it's always just black out for me so i can't really <laughs> like i can't really like like i see people like enjoying it and i see people maybe not enjoying it and like people moshing or whatever but it's like i always just like oh just played for 30 minutes i don't really remember what happened you know <laughs> um but i think like yeah like i mean especially like just from going to shows or like being a part of like a you know like another bigger tour where it's like oh like these kids want this you know like whether it be a breakdown or bass drops or like who should be like how how long you talk or like what you talk about you know it's like for us it's always been like play your songs talk a little bit and just keep keep going you know it's like and i think that's and for me i always thought chamber was a live band like no matter what no matter how many people were in the in the crowd i feel like we're better live than on recording just because like i feel like there's energy there and like recording obviously there's energy there but it's like it, it's a grind to record you know it's like you're you're there for a month and you're just you know you're not shot but you're just like ready to get it done and ready for people to hear it and then you sit on it for you know god knows how long and then it's out but live i feel like chamber is just a different not a different band per se but just like different there's there's so much energy there's just it's just i feel like it's raw i feel like it's just chaos all the way through and i feel like that's what we should like kind of lock into is just be just be a a crazy live band and as crazy as possible you know it's like that's what i want to be and i think that's what our new record kind of is you know just crazy just go crazy (laughs) have you have there ever been talks of maybe doing as much of a, a quote unquote live record recording as possible, like record, like knowing the material, whatever it is so down cold that like you can all get in a room and record it live. Um, um Yeah. I think we've talked about it for the new record. Just like do kind of like, hopefully maybe just get some friends that are good at recording and just do like a live little, you know, session or something like that. Especially just cause like some of these songs aren't that long. We could do like, four or five songs and just put it out on youtube or something but uh nothing as of now is like set in stone but we definitely want to do some stuff like that or even try to do like a live just like a live show just record it nicely and put it out on youtube just to kind of have stuff like we have a bunch of live shows out there on youtube but i feel like we could do something crazy in like nashville and just have it out there and it it would look awesome you know this might be a weird question having only really spent any time in nashville as an adult like in the last year and a half or so how is the scene for for metal out there um it's great man there's a lot of a lot of new bands there's a lot like i mean there's us orthodox but there's also a lot of newer bands playing and the scene is just uh it's crazy every time we come through it's awesome i feel like a lot of bands that come through love nashville like i feel like it's never 
not growing but also you know because it's a country music town it's like weird i can't say much because i'm from north carolina but every time i've been in nashville at a show it's always just insane or if chambers played there it's insane if i've seen like orthodox or you know like any other local band it's like awesome like this is crazy <laughs> it's just it was in my time there like my wife and a friend and i went and spent like i think four days there and i i was blown away by just the the sheer amount of talent that's in nashville oh, yeah. um, obviously knowing that it's a hotbed for like um recording and that's where a lot of artists go um so, I mean, I'm not surprised by that, but it is just literally at any given point, you can walk into any of the bars that are on that strip and yeah. like the sheer amount of talent that is. In, and some of the people, it's like I was talking to one dude and found out he essentially had been a high, he's a studio musician and has been on like just a fuckload of things. And I was like, and you're playing this random dive bar at like, like you're playing nudies at like three o'clock on a Thursday. Like this is kind of <laughs> wild to me, but like, I think it also showcases that people that are there just love music and love oh, playing yeah, and want to be part of it. But I didn't really see many places where it seemed like there was an avenue to have like venues. And I'm sure there are, mm -hmm. but to me, it's like, it's so saturated with country music or studio musicians that it's like, I don't, I didn't really get a vibe of like, Oh, I could definitely see like a hotbed of like, metal or like maybe rap or something like that it just right. didn't really get that vibe so it was a thing where knowing that most of the band is based out of nashville i, I was kind of thinking about like where does where does one play in nashville is it really as good of a scene or did you kind of have to travel in the outskirts and, and kind of make a name maybe not in your hometown um there's a small like not small venue but like i would say like a medium cab venue i think it's like 250 or 200 if you don't want to go too crazy <laughs> and try to get right uh, but it's called the end. Um, and that, that place is awesome. It's like perfect for just like a good sold out show that everyone is like going crazy or whatever. And the sound is like decent there. Um, there's bigger rooms called basement East, which is where we're playing at on this upcoming tour with Orthodox. Uh, and it's like a 500 cap. And I've, I was there with Kubla Khan and Dire Art and the show was crazy. It's awesome. It's like a 500 cap room. Um, and there used to be another spot. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but there's like, there is a lot of like DIY, like smaller, like house shows, having shows. And then there's a place called dark matter, which is like 150 cap that like I've seen bands play at. And it's just like awesome. You know, it's like, I feel like if you go to Nashville and go to the strip, you're going to be like, Oh, this is just country music. But like, if you are like avidly looking to go to shows, I feel like, metal shows there happen often even if whether it be metal or like hip-hop or pop or you know i think nashville is just a music loving city and so i think i think that's why things can grow there whether it be country music and i feel like nashville's even known for like a lot of like uh like video stuff even like whether it be music or acting or whatever so it's, i think there's a lot in nashville and there's so many people moving there that i feel like it's gonna be forever growing right almost like california you know it's like crazy <laughs> yeah i think my experience of being on like the strip was kind of whatever i felt like i enjoyed oh. it but like i also was like this is just southern vegas <laughs> essentially um yeah, yeah but yeah. i did i did enjoy like more of the area where we were staying at and just kept typically kept going back to dino's and uh yep. the red door um was kind of my spot that i just kept going back to um more of my vibe. is the burger spot right burger bar spot yeah it's yeah. awesome yeah been yeah. there a couple of times it's crazy yeah um but that end of town is kind of more where like i felt like and i remember there being a venue somewhere like over there and we we're gonna try to just go see a random show just because that's something my wife and i like to do is just go take in local stuff um yeah. whenever we're around but it's a it's a thing where i feel like that's kind of how that's one of the things i feel like on how you can kind of get a better sense of like the people and, and the environment because obviously being on the strip in nashville you're just kind of like it's touristy as shit um oh yeah it's cool to see historic places but like in the grand scheme of things it's there's nothing really that i can't get somewhere else um but i think that's that's been the joy for me of going around and, and traveling is to find and kind of experience different cultures and kind of learn about where things come from i mean i was talking uh with a person i'd had on the podcast a while ago um co coincidentally like i have so many people that are from like the north Car north and south carolina areas on this show yeah. um 
And, you know, I've only spent a little bit of time in both and Charlotte isn't really indicative of what all of North Carolina is like, but um, it was really interesting to go to the South and, you know, I wasn't really, my time out there wasn't really super positive in my light. Like I still feel like there was a lot of not even hidden racism going on, like just blatantly celebrating it. And oh yeah. It's, it was really tough. I mean, I think one of my biggest ones was, uh, where the fuck is that? Uh, Bravo show my wife watches from uh not party down south the either way it was uh not Myrtle Beach um something in South Carolina and I'm blanking on it but essentially like the thing that like bothered me was like we went to this rooftop bar and then as we were walking around I remember like one of the historical buildings was where the slaves were traded and like the day we happened to be there was like old white women selling doilies and random housewares that they made like on the literal tables and places where these people were like sold and broken up from their families and shit. And it's like, you can yeah. still feel it when you go there. And to me, like to see it just like not being paid the respect I felt like it deserved, like just was really heartbreaking. And like, I felt that when I was like down, down South, like I just yeah, feel it's, like it's celebrated still yeah, yeah. down South can be pretty rough. I feel like there's just the, just the older generation kind of like, doesn't want to pick up on, you know, just how wrong they can be you know it's just them being wrong in general so it's like rough man but i think I, I, there's like a lot of good about north carolina and south carolina but it's just i feel like it's it's like most places it's just the older generation doesn't want to just give it up and be like yeah we're wrong you know it sucks <laughs> how has it been you know living in it so like something Originally, I'm from Delaware. So being in one of the, the first, you know, 13 colonies that started the Americas and so forth and learning, or I should say kind of being browbeaten with that American history, um, since it's so relevant to the area that we lived in, I feel like at times when I travel, I kind of think about more of the beginnings of somewhere and like paying attention to more of where things come from, where they came from, where they're going. And I feel like, and I would pose the question to you when you've traveled maybe abroad where I feel like that's still something that's celebrated where it's like, you know, this is where we came from. This is some of our oldest buildings and they're still proud of it as opposed to tearing it all down and starting from new and the new bright thing. Um, how have you found that to be? I, I think that's like one of like my favorite things about traveling, especially like if we go to Europe or even like in Canada, it's just like the like buildings and the history of like what they were you know, the town or wherever it was, like, built upon, you know? It's, like, in, like, Europe, the buildings are insane. It's just, like, you go into it and you feel like you've been just taken back years, hundreds of years, you know? And it's just, like, this is awesome, but also, you know, could be sad in some points. But it's, uh, it, I think that's one of my favorite things is just, like, learning about the history of, like, a town or just seeing the buildings Cause like I feel like a lot of places, even in the states now, is just like a bunch of just copy paste of what looks modern or cool, you know. So mm -hmm. it's kind of boring. So it's like that. That's why it's like awesome. Like we're going to Europe in November. We just announced a tour today, and I'm just like so excited to like see stuff that like obviously we've been there before, but like see more of that. You know, it's just like historic buildings and just travel and see stuff that you haven't seen before. And I think that's like one of the coolest parts about touring is just like doing things that you couldn't do just sitting at home or like working, you know, like a day to day, -to -day job, like which we all do still. But like when we get to go on tour, like we're like, okay, like this is awesome. You know, it's like, it's yeah, it's crazy. This might be an odd question because I don't know what you do for work and you don't have to say any, say it, but um what is it like to try to explain to people the experiences that you have, like when you come back and have to kind of assimilate back to a quote unquote normal life? Um, it, so I've been at my, my job for like seven years now. I work at a restaurant, so it's like not too crazy, but my bosses understand. So they never like hound me with questions. But when I come back and there's like new people working, they're like, where have they think I'm the new person. So they're like, where <laughs> they're like, or like my, obviously like I have coworkers that have been there just as long as me. So they like probably tell them about me. They'll be like, Oh, like Jacob comes back this week. Like 
he's doing this. So they like how me with like questions of like, what's go like, what do you do? And this was like, uh, I tour and they're like, what do you mean? Like, like I, this one kid the other day asked me, he was like, what do you, what, where have you been? I was like, oh, I was like just on tour selling merch for a band. He's like, oh, you do graphic design. I was just like, no, I, I, I can, but I was just selling their merch and they're like, what does that mean? Like you, you're like a promoter. And I was like, no, <laughs> no. So it's like it, it, a lot of people don't, a lot of people know, but also some people don't, but like, like my boss will just be like, how was it? Did you have fun? Did you make money? I'm like, uh, I had fun, little money, but this is why I work. You know, it's like, this is why I'm back here. And he's like, all right, cool. Good to have you back. So that that's cool. And then like, my friend Ryan works there who also like plays music and stuff like that. So it's like good to see him. And then, so they, they kind of understand cause we've just, I've just been there so long, you know, it's like, they don't really question me too much. There's like, you have fun. I'm like, yep, it was fun. Good to see you guys. There's something to be said too. And there are times like I just switched uh, the job I had uh, essentially being general manager of a, a pretty big like hat apparel company that you'll see in malls. And it's a thing where I went back to a screen printing company that I had worked for for like five years, but I haven't been with the company in like 15. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's been interesting when you kind of get older and you think about some jobs. And I think restaurant jobs, I always joke, I'm like, I kind of like love the restaurant industry, especially working in kitchens and stuff, because it's like once you understand how to like make the things you need to make, And you can kind of go on autopilot for lack of a better term. It's like, man, the like camaraderie and just bullshit nature of working back there, like listening to music, fucking with each other, like making jokes. Yeah. It's it's so much fun, but it's a thing where I, I wonder, I don't feel like a lot of people, I don't think everyone's cut out for, for working in kitchens, especially like, like it's, it's a unique environment, but I tend to think that, I would assume most people who are into and into the touring world or whatever, I think would probably be very good people who work in kitchens or vice versa. I think it just, it creates this space where you have to learn quickly how to do a job. Mm -hmm. You have to do multiple jobs because you, especially like, you know, people are relying on you to do your part of the job. And I feel like it creates a team dynamic that you just inherently have to learn and communication and all those things that I feel like it just lends itself both both careers basically lend themselves to each other and are so mutually uh i don't know the word i'm looking for but you know just one in the same essentially that it, it doesn't surprise me when people who i think are making careers in the music industry i'm like i bet you probably could easily slide into a kitchen if this never worked out and find your way and probably could work your way up very quickly within in that industry yeah, for sure. I mean, my first job ever was working in a like a bar grill and I was like the only cook. And it, was, it wasn't like a super busy grill, but like on weekends, like obviously you're having like 15 tickets, whatever. And it's just like you got to learn so fast. And I feel like touring, you have to learn so fast or you just get like buried. You, yeah, you're just <laughs> like you're like getting absolute shit on and you're like never probably coming back to that that job again because it's like if you don't learn it fast, like someone else is going to take your job. You know, it's like, I feel like the same with the kitchen. There's always a crew of people. And if they don't work good together, th- something's going to happen. You know, it's like same with touring. It's like you have five or six, you have five members in a band. You have two crew. It's like, if you guys don't mesh well together, it's like obviously a problem. You know, it's like same thing pretty much. Uh, even like uh, working, like I-, I serve now at a restaurant. So it's like, even if the servers are not working well together, it's like, this could be a problem. You know, it's like, I think they do mesh like kind of well, like that, that analogy or whatever is like kind of similar. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're, if you tour, you kind of understand that like the back, back of the house restaurant kind of like ordeal, you know, it's like gotta be good. Everything's gotta be good. And you gotta be fast. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. I I don't know why I, what made me think of this but it's funny to hear that as you're serving now i'm like essentially your role is always kind of to be essentially the face and or extension of your business quote unquote and that you're always kind of having to be on in some capacity yeah yeah yeah. it's 
And my I I just came back to work last week. I think mm-hmm. was my first week back, and um, I uh, my boss was like, "Oh, you're not gonna have it," and I was like, "Oh, I've been selling merch for like three months. I think it's fine. Like it's kind of same. Like I just got to be nice to people, and they can tell me what they want. You know, it's like it's kind of similar. You know, it's like I, it's my hardest part is like, do I remember like the drink specials or like the the specials of the night? You know, it's like that's the hardest part. Do you? <laughs> This might be an odd correlation. Do you feel that maybe serving has made you a better front man at all? Um, I think to build that connection with someone so quickly. Yeah, I think it's maybe made me a better person to communicate with. Because mm. like at, at my job now, it's like I'm like try to be as fast as possible. But if like people want to talk about like, oh, like. What's the town like? What's this like? It's like you got to be nice and like not saying that I'm not a nice person at all, but it's <laughs> like you, you have to like kind of think fast and be like, oh, like this, this, this and this. So it's like when people do like eventually come up to me or talk to me at a show or whatever, it's like you, you just like kind of communicate well, you know, it's like your your communication is better than it would have been. But I've I think I've always been that way. It's like but like working at a restaurant, it's definitely it definitely brought me to be. I guess not as like, you know, like, I don't know how to explain it because it's like at a restaurant, like obviously you can have like mean customers and stuff like that. But I feel like I can kind of take the mean customer and make them happy. So it's like Mm. that, like, and never, no one's came up to me mad, you know, like at a show or anything. It's like, I hate you. Like your, your music is so bad. And it's like, at that point, it's like, I'm just going to laugh, but I'll be like, all right, well, you don't ever have to listen to it, but that's fine. But like, yeah, I, I think it's helped me communicate better with people that like my music, you know? It's serving is such a, an interesting thing. And I feel like, I don't know. I feel like just as a whole, I feel like most of the time I wish everyone had at least some experience working in, in the restaurant industry yeah. because I feel like it would teach you a, to be more calm and patient and understanding of like what's actually happening behind the scenes. Like, like you may think that like there's an expectation of more, well, my food should come out at this time, but it's like, there's a million other things that are happening and yeah. other people that it's like, it just, it really is a, a showcases that you aren't the center of everything and that there are other fucking people in the world and that you sometimes have to be patient and understand that like not everything you want will come to you the way and in the timely manner that you want it to happen. You just need to be patient and enjoy the experience along the way and be good yeah. to people. I feel like for me, just cause I work in the, the restaurant industry a lot. I've been there my whole life pretty much just cause like my first job was working in a kitchen and now I've been at this place for seven years. It's like, Every time I'm on tour and like a plate or like I'm at a restaurant and it's taking forever, I just kind of just got to remind everyone at the table like this happens, you know, it's like and like luckily like chamber, we all we've all been like in that world of like whether it be like coffee or restaurant business. So we understand. But it's like some tours like you hang out with like other bands and it's like, guys, it's cool. It's going to be all right. We're going to get food. Like, I know you're hungry, but. Or like to me, it's like kind of funny because like I'm never upset and like seeing other people upset, I'm just like oh, laughing. Yeah. And like I've got the wrong thing and I've waited for 40 minutes for food and I've just been like, I'm just going to eat this because I waited so long and it's kind of comedy at this point, you know? It's like I'm no matter what, I have food. If it's like something I didn't want, I would be mad, but I would just be like, oh, well, whatever. They're busy, you know? Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> I think the thing that's like frustrating at times, and I don't, I don't know if I'm the anomaly in this. I know in some of my traveling, uh, I can think of like when I had to go back, uh, to out to Arizona for my wife's uh, grandmother's funeral. We all went for a family meal and like the service is just fucking God awful. Like from jump, <laughs> then the food oh, yeah. forever. And like, there was nobody there. And it was still like an hour and a half before they closed. So it wasn't like they were like, we caught them like five minutes where they're done. And I remember like writing, like I was just like so upset by the the thing. And the whole point of us like going out was that like no one wanted to cook. And like, we just wanted to like, right, right. you know, get away from the house that, you know, their mom and grandmother had passed away and all the feelings and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, we just needed like you to provide like a space to just have an escape in. And you couldn't even do that. And so I remember like writing, 
or I think like, cause my food, which was the easiest thing to make took the longest. Like we were there, like it took over an hour to get me like my fucking burger. And I'm like, what oh the my fuck? God. And, and then my drinks, like, like I, I asked for like a pop and I never got it, <laughs> <laughs> but everyone else got theirs. And I'm yeah. like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? And I remember talking to the manager and then like, he was just like, Oh, well, I don't know what you want me to do about it. I was like, give a shit. Like that's literally all it comes down to. And like, it reminded me of like, I used to go to, I used to work at late night restaurant spot and I would leave work after working a 12 hour shift to get out at like four or five o'clock in the morning. And I would just go to McDonald's to get breakfast and I would order a sausage McMuffin, no egg. <laughs> and there was times I got a sausage biscuit. I got a McGriddle one time. I got a sausage McMuffin with just cheese. <laughs> no no sausage no nothing oh my like goodness. A, we, every every thursday for a month it was wrong <laughs> and then finally i'm looking at the receipt and it was like if you have a comment leave a com or call us let us know so i filled out an online thing detailing how this had just been happening week in and week out and i get a call a week later and the lady the manager there was just like hi this is so and so from the mcdonald's and such and such uh we received your thing and you know i'm just calling to see you know you know how we can make it better and i was like oh, they're like so what do you what do you want like do you want like a free meal or and i go no i want you to give a shit and i was like i would well, i would love to say that like it's as simple as I just want my fucking money back or whatever. But I was like, I literally do this same thing, but I don't have all the resources you do where I have someone taking the order, someone on the fucking line, someone expoing and all that. Like I work for 12 hours and essentially it's me and a delivery driver and I'm doing all of it. And you know how many fucking mistakes I made all night? None. Yeah. Like, it's, like, it's rough because like, especially at that, it's like sometimes it's the easiest thing that always gets messed up. And it's like, dude, how? Like, why yeah. are you doing this? You know, it's like, cause you're rushing. Yeah. It's cause you, I mean, and, and that's like the world of fast food. It's kind of like just always rushed. So no matter what, I feel like something's going to be wrong, especially like nowadays, like most people don't care. And that's like where the business kind of just like, if, if you have like a business where the manager or like whoever's in charge doesn't care, then it's like, Top down. it's already bad at that point because it's like, same with like even being a band. If like, people start to not care it's downhill you know it's like you got to have people that always want to put 100 percent into everything they do you know you know i uh did i said earlier i wanted to talk about hopeless portrait oh yeah something in the in the press release that i got kind of stuck out to me and i think it's a, an interesting talking point um so i'm gonna read the the comment that gabe made that's in the the press release because i don't mm -hmm. know actually see them um because sometimes when i talk about something that's contained within everyone's just like i don't know what's in it <laughs> uh, so gabe had said most of the songs on the record are confrontational and critical of others who are lost in addiction narcissism etc the lyrics and hopeless portrait are an acknowledgement that we are no better than the, those people in the grand scheme of things we are all trapped here trying to make the best of the lives we didn't ask for and there's a handful of things in that that really stuck out to me and then the idea you know surrounding even a theme of like, what is a hopeless portrait uh, mean when you took it, take in the phrase and, and kind of take in the music and everything. And the first thing that like, I wanted to kind of touch on is, you know, the idea that we're all trapped here trying to make the best of our lives that we didn't ask for. And I think that's such an interesting thing that a lot of us don't really think of is that it's like, sometimes when, when we as people, as a society, you know, whatever it is, are, fed up with things people kind of were like well kind of i think forget that that it's like well i didn't ask to be here like i'm, I'm now a part of something that's broken the system sucks and i like i'm trying i want it to be better but i also didn't ask to fucking be here and i'm not saying that from a perspective of like so i want to fucking be done and not live <laughs> right, right right i think the other part of it is that we I don't know. I just don't think that we f take that into consideration anymore of that. Like, like when people are blaming our generation or the generation before, it's like people had it. Like the people who came before us had a hand in fucking taking down and like destroying and leaving behind bullshit that we right. have to in in inherit. And it's like, why can't we be upset that, that this is happening? I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask like taking it another step. And I know I'm kind of going all over with this, but I'd read something during the pandemic that was saying, how there are 
there aren't as many people to care for the elderly anymore because people aren't having kids. And then when the elderly get old, they don't have anyone to take care of them. And I'm like, and it pissed me off because I was like, the point of my existence shouldn't be to take care of somebody else when they get older. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fucked up. Like that's the system failing all of us essentially, if yeah. that's what it was supposed to be. And to me, when I read that, that's where my mind went. It was that thought I had almost two years ago where I was like, the point of me existing shouldn't be to take care of somebody else. Mm hmm. Exactly. I mean, I, I think from my thoughts on that is like when we were thinking of topics on writing about on this record is um, it's kind of like a, a hand. You like sit at a poker table and you get a hand like you you were dealt that hand no matter what and you can't change it. You know, it's like I mean, you can <laughs> like in real life, you can change what what makes you happy, what makes you sad, what makes you you can change everything. But like we we always thought about like whether it be like you know we're growing up our our lives and our like our home lives aren't as good or whatever it's like we didn't really ask to be here but no matter what we're gonna have to take it and make it better you know it's like mm -hmm. that's like what I mainly wanted to talk about on this record is because like uh, just growing up is like rough you know but like at the end of the day it's like made me who I am and I'm happy because of that and it's not because like. And like we've all we've always wrote about like you know this like sadness that that brought us but like at the end of the day it's like it's made you who you are and you got to take that with you no matter what whether it be sad happy angry but take that and make it better because like at the end of the day it's on you mm -hmm. and no one else you know it's like like your family could be the worst people in the world but like as as long as you see that and make your life better it's like or it doesn't even have to be family really it could be your job it could be the people you hang out with it could be whoever but as long as you are trying to make your life better and no matter what hand you got dealt it's like it's on you and it's like to me it's like that's what that kind of mean that kind of meant you know it's like we have to you know make our own lives better before we can search happiness anywhere else you know it's like it's it is hard out there and especially just because there's so much going on in the world that like at in the grand scheme of things we're nothing and no one and we can't really do much but as long as like you're trying something's gonna be done you know it's like as long as you're trying to be a better person or be happy or like change the way even like when it comes down to fitness too like i've been trying you know trying to be healthier and stuff like that like a lot of stuff depends on you you know yeah and i feel like I feel like no matter how long you can sit and stew on the past, it's always going to be there. You know, it's like, uh, and, and it sucks sometimes because like, that's, that's, you know, how you learn things, but like, you just got to look past that. I feel like, and that's like, when I was talking to Gabe about writing about this, uh, uh about like what I wanted to write about, like he had the same thoughts. It's like, let's, forget about what really happened kind of like forgive like past things and just like take the good of them you know it's like stuff happens for a reason i feel like and no matter what like you have to be just always looking forward and that's that's kind of how i i view it and i think that's kind of how like uh gabe was viewing it too it's like it's it's life is rough but like you can make it better and like it's not even like a that's what we always want to talk about. It's just like something that is kind of a topic on a lot, you know? Well, I think one of the bigger things and something I kind of took away from that, that I, I don't necessarily want to call it a mission statement, but I feel like it kind of is, um, is the other part of it was just taking ownership and, and having a, a greater sense of understanding of, of other people and not mm -hmm. thinking solely of yourself, you know, like I was saying earlier and, the thing about it is, you know, I feel like we as people are so quick to, to judge people and to not even think about, you know, like what it takes to, for someone to get there that, you know, like you were saying, like, you know, the hand you're dealt and you can make the changes and so forth. But something I, I kind of think of is like, you know, hearing like you see those stories on Instagram or whatever that pop up, uh, or at least I do they pop up all the time. Um where someone will kind of explain the story of like how they became homeless and how they lost things. And it's, it's not really 
sometimes it is like, oh, it was a, a slow descent into like, I've made terrible decision after terrible decision after terrible decision. A lot of times, though, it's like it's something as simple as like, I like lost my job. And then like, we lived in an area and my house got hit with a flood. And like, we didn't yeah. have the money to like fix something. And then, you know, my wife left me or the something happened. And it's like, it's like some people are like, we are all tentatively two to three, like, kind of bad things happening to us in a row where it's like, can you sustain that? Or would you be in this situation if like one or two things happened in your life? And it's it's now it's like, fuck, I don't have any money to handle paying off something like that. I don't have anywhere I could go. I don't, you know, these these things that happen. And when you hear some of these stories and think about it, like in your own life, like how would what would I do in this situation that we're we're all other than some of like the wealthiest fucking people in the world, we are all pretty close to like having something happen in our lives to where that could be us. Yeah. For sure. That's the thing I know my wife and I talk about all the time. You know, we watch Roseanne and the thing we always comment about is like, it feels like our lives growing up. Cause like they weren't super rich. A lot of times they were just making it by, you know, rich in love kind of of sorts. And that it took, you know, random things happening in our lives where it's like we were able to kind of be more successful maybe than where our parents are or were and wanted better for ourselves and do these things but it's also when we you know my wife got a car that she's been after for a long time and it's got all the bells and whistles and shit and you know i made the comment to her i was like can you believe you finally got it she goes no and i go well you should you've been busting your ass for 13 fucking years at this job worked your way as one of the first eight employees at a startup to now it's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and all this kind of stuff and you know you are one of the top people at it because of all the work you've put in like yeah. this is the reward and yeah. even knowing that like superficial things like nice cars trips whatever they're super fucking nice and i enjoy them but also i understand that it could go away and i could be happy just had literally having the roof over my head and being able to only survive on 25 dollars a week or something that i i've known that too and that I wouldn't be above living that way if it meant that like, I'm just, my basic needs are met and that's it. And to me, I feel like that's something when I listen to Hopeless Portrait and I listen to some of the, the newer songs, like there is kind of that connection to that where I, I get angry at some of the world around me, but I also try to remember that I'm not better than any of the people that maybe I, f society would tell me that I'm better than and right. that we are all one thing away from possibly being in those situations. And so to me, I feel like I haven't gotten to hear the whole record. I'm, I'm interested to see lyrically where some of the other ideas and themes and so forth on the record, like how they carry over throughout the whole thing and what kind of a, a maybe overarching story narrative is kind of told throughout. Um, but I do hope that people do take the time to, to go through that journey and, and hopefully, uh, kind of do yeah. some inward reflection because i think it's it's something as i get older i think is in, insanely invaluable for sure i mean I, I i hope people take the time to like read what we me gabe henry have like taken the time to write and uh it's uh it's i feel like the overall topic is like similar to m most of the songs but there's obviously like one or two out there that are a little bit different but yeah i mean i've always there's always been like in life some form of like you know you look at the past and you kind of like dwell on it and hate on it but like in the past couple years to me it's been like let's kind of like take it and like even when it comes like to family or friends it's like you never know what someone's going through whether it be like their personal problems their mental health their their like job is sucking the soul out of them it's like you never know what's happening so it's like yeah, they might not be there for you as much as they can or like per se like your family or your friends so and like taking that and just like kind of forgiving them because like you're you're not always a perfect person you're not always there for people when they need you so it's like just kind of like try to figure out that balance between like forgiveness and hatred you know i guess hmm. for me for me for sure like it's just like that's what we i my topics like when writing down lyrics were about just like kind of like just what hopeless portrait is pretty much about like it's just that's that's it you know it's like that's what i wanted most of the songs to be about and it's like we kind of 
continued with that because like me and Gabe kind of go through the same stuff sometimes and it's like we kind of work well with each other so it's like all right we're writing about this and this is the topic you kind of make words sound cooler than I can so like let's bounce off each other here you know it's like it's really it's a it's a fun process and I hope people take the time to read it I think it's uh I think for me like that's that's the thing where you know I came to this conclusion somewhat recently um you know I sometimes get some shit from people who listen to the show where it's like I don't feel like you like heavy music like you seemingly think you do and it's like I do but the problem sometimes is is like I feel like it needs to be something else like I realized a while ago, like I think I was at Janet Jackson or something, and I was like, "This is cool because it's a vibe, and like people at a show like that are just wanting to have a good time, and it's just an outlet to like listen to songs that make you happy." Mm-hmm. But I feel like when I go to hardcore shows and I go to metal shows, there's something more I get out of it because I feel like it's such a cathartic release for so many, like a room full of people who need to vent these things to to get out these frustrations, to to sing these lyrics that mean something to them, right? And you know, I'm sure that someone like a Taylor Swift or something like that, I'm sure there are people who maybe those lyrics do that for them. But in all of my experiences at going to all these different types of shows, I don't see that same emotional release as I do when I go to hardcore and metal shows. And therefore I've really kind of understand, or I've come to understand that there's really kind of a, a beauty to it that I don't see in any other scene or genre um and all the different types of shows i go to and i think that's why why i always come back to it it's why when i start working out again or i need that motivation that's the music i throw on like i always joke yeah. with my wife when we go to the gym i'm like how the fuck do you listen to pop music while you're like trying to work out like that just doesn't seem like it motivate me to be um, a better person yeah it, i mean i've been in and out of the gym for like past year and it's like when i'm doing cardio i can kind of listen to whatever because it's like it being pop it's like oh it's like high tempo like you can like kind of run or like walk or do whatever like i've been listening to this uh, artist called breakins a lot it's kind of like hyper pop ish i guess i I don't know how to explain it it's like weird but it's cool but it's like it's always hyper there's some sad stuff but like whatever but when i do cardio i listen to that and then like when you're lifting weights it's totally different though it's like you got to put on like the heaviest thing you can find maybe it's normally <laughs> kublacan or mushuga or uh, some old slipknot or something like that that's used hey breed's gotta be in there hey breed's, hey breed's in there like, yeah like a building <laughs> there's this band from north carolina that i always put on when i do uh cardio and they're called advent and it's just mm-hmm. non-stop just fast music so it's like if i'm trying to run fast i'm like yeah let's do this but yeah i, <laughs> I agree it's like metal and hardcore there i feel like there's no community you can find anywhere else in the music world like obviously there is but like i feel like metal and hardcore like fans are accepting no matter like who you are where you come from um and i feel like as far as like the show goes the energy goes it's insane like compared to any other shows that i've been to it's like metal and hardcore is then that's what i feel like brings everyone back it's just like the energy is insane like even when i started going when i was like 16 i was like this is crazy you know it's like everyone's everyone's like moshing everyone's yelling the wor- words it's like this is awesome and it's like yeah you can go to like i guess a like per, like you said like a taylor swift concert or like a uh, post malone concert or whoever but it's like i, I don't it's it's ca- it's kind of hard because like in a world of like your taylor swift or post malone it's like there's forty thousand people there you know and it's like all right, there's a lot of people here and it's like I there's going to be like a, a handful of people that I couldn't connect with ever because like we're totally <laughs> different or and, and you go to a hardcore show and there's like 200 to like I guess like the biggest like hardcore show like a fest or something like maybe like 5000, you know, it's like most of those people you can connect with somehow whether it be it's like I I grew up doing the same things. I work in the same kind of industry. I um you know i you know it's like i i like to lift weights i like tattoos or whatever you know it's like you're kind of like similar so it's like that's why i think people come back always because the energy and the community and just the people in general are just like you know you can connect with them better whether it's like i mean you i i never like growing up never went to like huge concerts because like my parents always worked and like they didn't 
like really like i never went to like fest or like concerts like you know like talking about like uh like arena stuff you know like i went to like shows like because like my brother played music and stuff like that but like so like, i guess it's, it's something i've always done so i've never like took it to compare and be like oh i i i see the you know i see the similar similarities because like i i've never been able to compare them you know but i feel like that's why hardcore metal is the best because like you can you can find anyone in the crowd and just like kind of connect with them you know it's like it's the best yeah yeah that that realization came through writing about music when i used to do show reviews and getting to do some of the different stuff like talking or going to like little wayne and you know janet jackson and doing some other stuff but then also doing like every time i die and you know more stuff like that it's you know being in those environments really just kind of showcased a lot of the different types of people that come to these things and how music brings people together but also yeah. kind of made me realize as i love and go to so many different types of shows and concerts of varying sizes and levels that that's kind of the epiphany i had where i was like i love going to see music but there are some some forms of music some genres of music where i i get something more out of it um all that said to kind of start wrapping up because i i got a, another one of these in about 15 minutes but yeah, yeah um where can everyone find you or anything you'd like to plug online um i guess just chamber chamber 615.com or chamber nashville on instagram uh i'm always there i mean if you want you can find me on instagram at just my name jacob lily but other than that just check out chamber and hopefully you like the new record we're putting out in a month excited to uh to get into the rest of it i was kind of surprised i didn't get the full full thing because usually that's one of the perks of, of doing this is i get stuff yeah. beforehand but maybe I have i'll to be like i'll tell them to send it over your way <laughs> fair enough we'll enjoy the rest of your day and uh hopefully see you I, I was checking the tour dates i didn't see you guys were coming to michigan that i saw and i think I, we're I, playing detroit or hamtrak which is right oh, hamtrak of, okay yeah so i think yeah, you're yeah, playing hamtrak. sanctuary yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah we always play that place it's awesome yeah, I was going to say, I can't remember the last time I think you played Grand Rapids because I, th I saw you, I think, on that 18 Visions run you did that played in Detroit. Yeah. Um, was, it was the CU Space Cowboy. CU Space Cowboy, yeah. And uh, yeah. we played uh, Grand Rapids on the Wage War Tour. I can't remember the venue, but we played I think Grand we were, Rapids. I think we were on a trip, I think, because I think yeah. we saw that tour in Atlanta and we weren't here, but uh -huh, we yeah. are. Uh, yeah, that was the first time being at the Masquerade, which I thought was going to be a super awesome venue and realize it's almost like uh, St. Andrews in Detroit, where if you are short or like me and yeah. you're not one of the first fucking people in the door, the first like 20, then you're shit out of luck because every all the tall people will then be right in your way. Plus the pillars and all that yeah, stuff. It's rough. It's <laughs> rough. Well, hey, man, yeah. it was great talking to you, man. I appreciate yeah, you, as well. you having me on. Yeah. Enjoy the rest awesome. of your day. Yeah. Take care, buddy. So that was my conversation with Jacob. Again, Chamber's new record is out now. It came out this past Friday. I love to kill four. Go check it out. Uh, it's really great to kind of, again, see a band that I think is doing some things really adventurously uh, in the genre that makes someone even as old as myself uh, take notice and get really interested uh, in what's going on. Um, you know, I talk quite a bit about with friends and, and even on this show, just kind of about the, the falling out of love of, of music at, for a little while. And, you know, something that makes it a little bit interesting at times is I feel like there's just such an abundance. Like I was thinking about this again, going back to upheaval, like there are now three stages this year at upheaval. So it's like you had the local stage, you had some of the other, uh, bands, you know, just bands playing at all times. And it just felt so overwhelming and you felt bad for me. Like, well, I got to catch this set and then like there's five minutes of a carryover from when this set ends to like this band starting and, you know, I got to make the track and I got to do all this stuff. And for a minute, I, I kind of thought to myself as I was just, I guess, kind of being lazy, like I was like, I don't want to go down the hill. I, I'll I'll get down to go see. I think it was Lamb of God. I was like, oh, I've seen them a ton. I'm just going to I'll get there when I get there. And I was thinking to myself about how like it kind of is that way with music, new music, where it's like man, there's so much stuff I need to check out, like things that people are pumping up. And it just feels overwhelming to to be like, okay, everyone's talking about this band. I got to go check this out. Okay, I got to go check out this band. 
And it just gets to the point where you have to also understand, you're like, I'll get there when I get there. And it's okay. It's okay to feel overwhelmed and it's okay to uh, take your time with things. And, you know, music is one of those great things that it will always be there for you. Um, I've talked countless times about records that I didn't like or I didn't think I liked. And it just took a, an experience to happen in my life that all of a sudden, like, the pieces fit and this music now is like my everything. It connects so many things, even if it wasn't heard or experienced when it first came out. Um, so I feel really, I, I keep wanting to say privileged or blessed. And I know that sounds kind of stupid, but, you know, to hear a record like this, to hear it when it's first coming out and to be excited about it in real time with everyone else. Uh, it's actually been really fun to kind of see like the reaction, like, you know, the last couple of days being at Upheaval, even though the reception was kind of spotty as fuck, just because there's so many people in such a s small area, condensed area. Uh, it was really cool to see, you know, the chamber guys uh, on their Instagram stories and so forth posting, you know, people getting the record, you know, people being excited about this song or this part of a song or whatever. And like I said, it, it's been fun to kind of re be inspired, re becoming a fan of things. Um, and even, you know, just, I think that was something the festival kind of brought back to me where it was just fun to look out. Like, uh, during ice nine set, there was a, a, and I posted a quick little video I took of it. Um, a lot of times when, and quick side tangent before I say the other side tangent story, a lot of times when I go to shows from having put on shows and just trying to watch everything that's happening and taking in everything, um, I really enjoy seeing the experience of a thing from somebody else's perspective, especially if it's a band like Ice Nine that I've seen a whole shitload of times, uh, very in the last couple of years. And to see this dad with some of my friends, like just a couple of feet away from me, and it looked like it was his kids, you know, first show, and it's a moment they're all sharing, and he's getting into, you know, Ice Nine during the breakdown or whatever. And it's just those are the kind of moments that when I see them, I'm like, oh, this is this is so much fun. This is so cool to see this and to kind of see other people's reactions uh, to something. It's it's incredible. Um, and so, you know, again, going back to the chamber guys, it's really cool to kind of get to experience uh, everyone having their firsts with this record now that it's out finally. Uh, and to, to see what it does for them and to see where it goes from there. And, you know, it'll be interesting when the band tours uh, and comes around, like, what does that and tour end up looking like? What do these songs look like for people? And uh, I just feel like there's there's a lot of great things on the horizon uh, for for Chamber. Uh, starting to wrap up this episode, if you would like to keep up with Chamber, it's simple enough right now. Uh, I would just say go to chamber615.com. That is your landing page for everything for the band. Uh, if you would like to keep up with them, I'll plug the socials as I always do. Uh, Facebook is Chamber TN. Instagram is Chamber Nashville. And Twitter is Chamber615. I didn't find any socials for Jacob personally. I don't know if I just didn't look hard enough, but there was nothing that I, I in all the ways I usually can find someone if I can't just find them very quickly. Um, I, nothing came up. So uh, apologies if Jacob does have an Instagram page. Um, otherwise, go check the band out. Uh, they are on tour right now. They are out for the next month. Uh, currently, as I'm, when I'm recording this right now, they are out in Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they will go through uh, doing a quick uh, U.S. run all the way up until August 13th. And then uh, they take some time off and then go out in November overseas. Um, so catch them. I think they're going to be on the road quite a bit. Uh, tell Jacob and the dudes uh, what's up if you see them. And uh, very much looking forward to catching a show of theirs. Uh, they are playing uh, out in Hamtramck. Uh, August 12th for those that are a little bit more local uh, here to the Michigan area. I'm going to try to hopefully go out and see them and uh, see the guys and see them watch, watch them just rip it because I'm sure it's going to be a fucking banger of a show. All that said, if you would like to keep up with the podcast, you can find us simple enough. Bruce Beat Pod on all your major social media platforms. I don't have threads or whatever the fuck that new thing is that I keep seeing people talk about. I don't have, I don't have most of the things I, I have the things that you would expect someone to have a Facebook an Instagram, a Twitter. Uh, I have those. Uh, so if you'd like to follow me, keep up with me, you could do that. Like I said, uh, I was very active uh, this past weekend on Instagram, doing stories, doing a couple posts, uh, seems to be 
something everyone kind of enjoyed. So maybe I'll get a little more active when I go to shows and kind of posting stuff like that. Um, got a lot of great comments and feedback. So uh, it was good to see that the hard work of my wife and friends and myself uh, went was appreciated. You can also email me at brutallyspeaking at gmail.com. Uh, if you have a guest suggestion, uh, want to leave me a comment about something, whatever, uh, I read all my email. So send me something if you're interested. And our podcast sponsors, want to thank them again, rockabilia.com. Use our code BREW10 at checkout. Take 10% off your total purchase order. Uh, I want to thank them for uh, continually supporting the show and Starving Artist Brewery. Uh, again, I think all the time, uh, and even being at a festival, hearing people talk shit about bands, people, all, all kind of the whole gamut, uh, you know, judge beer, not people. So, uh, something I need to try to do a little bit better at myself at times, but love the starving artist people. I'm actually, I was sharing some of the beers, uh, that I was graciously given, uh, with some friends that are in from out of town. So it has been really great getting to kind of, uh, enjoy good local craft beer, and some uh, camaraderie as well, which is the vibe entirely if you go out there and go check them out. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John, and I will see you all next week where we have Tuck from Fit for a King, Off-Road Minivan, coming back to discuss the new Off-Road Minivan record. It was, it was a good one. Can't wait for you all to hear it. I'll talk to you then.